First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter three. I don't have. Yeah, First Thessalonians chapter three. I don't have anything too long tonight, but the Lord taught me a couple things out of this passage last week. As we've been going through First Thessalonians, we stopped in the end of chapter two, which is mainly about Paul saying. We really want to come see you because after we led you to God and after we taught you and discipled you, you know, we were pulled away from you and now we want to come back, but uh, Satan hindered us. Verse 19 in chapter 2, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So chapter 3, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear... We thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So they were concerned about the Thessalonians. They were being persecuted really heavily, literally being killed, martyred, some probably beaten to death. I don't know exactly what was going on, but they were definitely suffering heavy afflictions uh, it's that's really plain in chapter two and the rest of First Thessalonians, and Paul and Silas and Timotheus were concerned. So Paul and Silas, while they were at Athens, stayed there and sent Timotheus, "Hey, go check on the Thessalonians. We want to know how they're doing. We want to know if they're if they've quit on the faith. They're going through a lot right now, but we want to know: uh, are they sticking to it? Are they are they being faithful? And Timotheus, the purpose that he sent them was to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith." So when you're coming into persecution or when you're coming into tribulation, which is possible for the Christians right now, that persecution will come more and more as our government becomes more and more uh, tyrannical, it's possible that we're going to receive persecution. It's not unfathomable. I'd say two months ago, I would have thought, eh, I guess three months ago, I would have thought there's no way the government would ever take away your you know, Bill of Rights like that. That'd be insane. But boom. They took it away. And I'm not saying the Bill of Rights are God-given. The the government has a right to take them away right now, sadly. And I hope hope that the um, judicial system, the Supreme Court, takes care of the unconstitutional things that were happening because it'd be great if our country uh, followed the Constitution. Sadly, it doesn't. And um, it's possible that persecution is coming, is my point. And the two things that Paul was concerned of the Thessalonians was he wanted them to be established established. And Paul talks about this a lot in his epistles, this idea of being rooted, that you've been planted as a seed. You know, somebody sowed the seed of the gospel in your life and then they watered it. And then, you know, God gave the increase and you got saved. You believed on Jesus Christ. And from that moment, all you are is just, you know, a seed down in the ground and you need to grow up. God wants you to grow up in the faith. But before you can grow tall, you know, the old adage that there's For every one inch of tree you see above ground, there's three inches underground. Uh, There's three inches of roots for every one inch of tree. And God wants you to have strong, deep roots. He wants you to be established, to have a strong foundation. And if you don't have a strong foundation, if you're a building and you have a weak foundation, like the man who built his house on a sand, when the storm comes, you're going to blow over. You're not going to stand. You say, how do I get established? You study the Bible. You get deep in the word of God because he has given you these words to grow you. Remember in Peter, it says, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. The milk of the word, like a baby calf needs milk to get bigger and stronger, fatter. We need milk to grow up in the word of God and to be established, to get deep roots. Uh, And you can go, if you want commentary on that, read Psalm chapter one. It's really good. And you'll see the correlation. Um, And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you. That was the first thing. The second thing, and to comfort you. You know, it's hard. I've never been through real strong persecution. I've been through tiny little bits of it, but not real strong persecution. And uh, I can imagine you'd want some comfort. Uh, When things are going really hard, like, you know, we talked about last week. It's Imagine being a guy in Thessalonica and the, the Jews who didn't believe came and pulled your mom out into the street and had her killed. You know, stuff like that was happening. Imagine the comfort you'd want. You know, we talked about it last week. It, you'd be sitting there probably thinking, is this faith that I have chosen to believe in really worth it? Because I've already lost a couple family members over it. 
and I'm probably going to die tomorrow because of it. Is it worth it? You know, you, you could get really discouraged, and God wants to comfort you. And uh, Second Th- Corinthians, I'll go there really quick. Second Corinthians chapter one. Second Corinthians one says in verse three, "Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all." comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ and he goes on to explain that a little more but the big idea is when you go through tribulation God's going to give you comfort and there's a couple reasons for that one you need comfort you know if, if I was going through a real hard time and I was discouraged and I didn't get any comfort, it's probable that I could make some bad choices. I could, you know, there's a whole lot of things you can do when you're discouraged. You're kind of out of your right mind when you're really down, when you're in the dark and you can't see and you don't want to take the next step. You could just give up on life, you know? So you need comfort. That's why God gives it. He also gives it because there are other Christians in your life. And when God comforts you, he wants you to remember that. He wants you to take it on. How did God comfort me? Maybe he gave you a Bible verse. Uh, in First Thessalonians 4, verse 18, after he talks about the translation, when we get caught up, he says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So sometimes God's going to give you Bible verses to comfort you. Uh, maybe sometimes he's going to send a brother in Christ to, I don't know, maybe you're dirt broke and you need food to feed your family and a brother's going to send you a little money. That's comfort to know that God's watching over you even though you didn't ask for it. Uh, There's all kinds of comfort he could give, but God wants you to remember that because as we saw in 2 Corinthians 1, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So when God comforts you, you ought to take that comfort and remember it so that when you come across a brother who's in trouble, you can pass on the same comfort. Hey, the Lord helped me out with this Bible verse. Hey, when when I was really needy, somebody gave me $100 and here, I've got an extra hundred bucks. Here you go. You know, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be money. It could be a word of comfort. It could be anything, praying for somebody, uh, being an encouragement. So that goes along with the theme that's also going through Thessalonians. That is, you can't be a solitary Christian. You, you, as a good Christian, you can't just sit alone huddled for the rest of your life. Uh, it would be wonderful, you know, for me in the flesh to be sitting, sitting alone, huddled up with Karen the rest of my whole life. And we never had to talk to anybody. That's how my personality is but that's wrong. (laughs) As a Christian, you ought to be related to other people. You ought to be talking with other people, comforting other people, ministering. God didn't create the church so that you could sit alone and, you know, have Jesus to yourself. Um, You ought to be dealing with brethren. You ought to be trying to encourage people, uh, trying to comfort people. And that's why Paul sent Timotheus uh, to the Thessalonians to establish them and to comfort them concerning their faith. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 3.3 that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We've talked about that before. A Christian is appointed to afflictions. It's literally what we're called to. Uh, job title, Christian. <laughs> job description, afflictions. <laughs> it's, it's right there. God, it's plain as could be. Uh, Christians are going to suffer. It's what we do. Um, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, it's, it's plain as day in the Bible. We're going to suffer. And God gives us comfort. He doesn't leave you alone in that suffering. Verse 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And ye know. Ye know. <laughs> they went through a lot. Ye know. Verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear. And forbear means, like, wait. I can't wait. If, if I can't forbear, you know, I love Karen so much and my love actually let's reverse this because karen's actually this way sometimes she gets such a explosive feeling up in her heart she's like i just have to hug you and she'll just you know come give me a hug and she nothing could stop her from giving me a hug in that moment because that's the way that joan raised karen (laughs) and that karen is which is a great thing she cannot forbear she wants to hug me she cannot forbear so she will hug me You, you can't stop yourself so paul Uh, could not forbear 
because he wanted to know how the Thessalonians were doing. He cared about them. Uh, he loved them. And I could not, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Because all he could think about, they didn't have Facebook to see how people were doing. Uh, he had to send Timotheus to see, how are the Thessalonians doing? You know, are they doing all right? Because I can't forbear. I can't wait. I've got to know. I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. So that's the second time Satan's specifically come up in First Thessalonians. In chapter 2, verse 18, we saw Paul wants to go see the Thessalonians, but Satan hindered him. And here in 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, verse 5, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. And we know in Jesus' um, parable about the sower and the seed, there's a piece of ground, you know, there's a good ground, there's a thorny ground, there's a stony ground. Uh, one of the bad grounds is they receive the word, but they don't grow any deep roots. So right away, Satan takes away the seed. And, and Paul was concerned. We just preached to the Thessalonians, but right away they got hit with a storm. You know, they, they're a tiny little sapling. They just got planted, but, you know, it's monsoon season in Thessalonica, and they're getting hit with persecution, tribulation, affliction. And I really hope that Satan hasn't plucked them up. I really hope that the tempter hasn't tempted you and our labor be in vain. How discouraging is it as a laborer when you're sowing seed and you're laboring? You spent a whole day sweating in the field. Uh, to come back the next day and see that your seed got plucked up. You know, some wolves or some, I, I don't know, whatever plucks up seed, plucked up your seed. It, it's discouraging. I don't want my labor to be in vain. I don't want to waste my time on this earth. And more importantly, I don't want those people I ministered to, to fall away. You know, you want fruit that remains. Nobody wants to plant a fruit tree that bears fruit that dies right away. Or plant a tree and have it die right away. You want that fruit to remain. And uh, Paul didn't want his labor to be in vain, obviously. So he sent to know how they were doing. Verse 6. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And this doesn't mean if the Thessalonians had fallen away that Paul would physically die. But, you know, the saying, you know, this is now this is living, you know, this to really live. Some people uh, exist and some people live, the old saying. If you are uh, just getting by in life and you're not happy at all, somebody says, well, he's not living, you know, he's just existing. And Paul's saying, you know, if you guys had fallen away, what is this life to me? You know, I'm not really living uh, if you guys didn't stand fast. But... Because they stood fast in the Lord, he lived. So Paul's going as far as to say that how you Thessalonians are doing spiritually affects me daily. And this goes to what, you know, Paul's heart is for churches. Paul's heart for churches was, I spent hours, days, weeks, months, sometimes years of my life ministering to you. I don't want you to fall. Um, and when you're ministering to people, you can't just stop caring. You can't minister to them, leave, and forget. You have to constantly attend to them. Uh, like a shepherd is constantly concerned about his sheep. Uh, you're constantly wondering about their estate, hoping that they're doing well, hoping that they're still serving God. And um, Paul is a wonderful example of how to minister because you can see just from that verse, if the people that he had ministered to fell away or if they stopped believing, they did something and and quit on God, Paul's Paul would die. Not physically, but he you know, he would be horribly discouraged. He would be distraught. But because he knew they were doing all right, he lived. And it's really encouraging when you find out somebody you've uh, ministered to is doing well. Verse nine. Don't let me bore you. We're going through I'm I was raised uh being taught two things. One, uh there's a difference between teaching and preaching. And I Jeff doesn't like this, that's why he's scowling. I believe good doctrine is important in both. Uh, but right now, my purpose is to teach you through the book of 1 Thessalonians so that when we're finished, you can come away with an understanding a little better of what 1 Thessalonians says and what it means. That's my purpose here. So I'm not just sticking on one verse. We're going through a lot. Another thing that I think is important to mention is that, you know, the, the farther along we get in the world, it seems like churches get farther away from doing right. Not seems like it is true because in Revelation 2 and 3, church history ends with Laodicea, a very cold and complacent church. 
uh, that thinks they're doing all right, but really they're naked and blind and poor. And um, something that old churches used to do that I almost never see anymore is before the preacher would ever, I'm talking like 1800s, 1700s churches, before the preacher would ever get into a sermon, before prayer, before singing, the pastor would get up and start the service by reading like one, two, three, four, five chapters of the Bible, just reading it. You say, why? Because they really cared about the Bible. Because they knew that the most important part of a church service is the Word of God. And the most important part of your life is the Word of God. So um, we're going through a lot of verses here. And just try to stay with me because it's important. (laughs) Verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So you say, what's the point if, if Paul planted and he watered and he, he led those people to the Lord and he discipled them, he was there at least three full weeks, you know, wh- why would he need to go and see them again? He needs to see them because there are some things lacking in their faith. And we all have things lacking in our faith. We all ought to probably daily pray, you know, Lord, help thou my unbelief. Uh, there are things, no matter how far along you think you are in the Christian life, if you've been saved 80 years or if you've been saved two years, uh, there are obviously things missing. There's more uh, that you ought to be doing. There's more that you ought to know about the Bible. There's more that you ought to believe and think in your heart. There's more that you ought to be doing on a daily basis. And there are always things lacking in your faith. No one's arrived. Uh, remember in Philippians, Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God uh, in Christ Jesus. And as a Christian, you can't get complacent. You know, it's not a sprint. It's not a two-year thing for us. This is a marathon where you've just got to keep up. you got to keep going. you got to keep running. Every day, get a little stronger. Every day, know a little bit more Bible. Every day, try to comfort somebody else. Be a blessing. Be an encouragement. Because there are always things lacking in your faith. And the point I wanted to make from this verse is you need help from other people. You know, the Thessalonians needed help from Paul. They needed him to come and show them things that were lacking in their faith because he was farther along than them. I need somebody like Jeff to help me because he's been in the faith a whole lot longer. He's been in the Bible a whole lot longer, and he helps me in things where I lack. Karen needs me uh, in places where I lack. Sometimes I need Karen in things that I lack. Normally, I lack things like compassion. It's my nature. I like to, I'm, I'm very stoic by nature. I'm very apathetic by nature sometimes towards people. I need Karen sometimes to remind me, Daniel, you need to care about people. Daniel, you're sounding a little uh, coarse. You're sounding a little unrefined right now. You know, you're sounding a little hard. Uh, why don't you soften up, you know? Uh, and she doesn't preach to me. Karen doesn't preach, but she helps me by her example. Uh, most of all, she shows me what it's like to be a compassionate person. She cries for people. She prays for people. She's concerned about people when they're not doing right. And uh, I need that more. She helps me. Sometimes she needs a little help with things like discipline and choosing to do right even when you don't feel like it. You know, we all need help. We all need things uh, that are lacking in our faith. And you need other people's help with that. Verse 11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. There's a whole lot in those last two verses. I'm going to break it down really quickly. First, in verse 12, notice the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So the thing he wants them to do is abound in love. Verse 13, why? To the end, here's the purpose. He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. So that shows me, I want to be unblameable before God. I want to be holy before God. I know I'm never going to be perfect. I'm always going to make mistakes, but I want to strive to do what's right. According to this verse, the thing that I need to be doing to head in that direction is to abound in love one toward another. And we've talked about that before, and you might say, Daniel, you sound a whole lot like a lovey-dovey little, you know, fluffy Christian right now. And this is 1 Thessalonians 3. Uh, if you, I don't know if you noticed or not, but there's not much 
heavy, deep, you know, uh, divisive doctrine going on in First Thessalonians 3. It's pretty standard. It's kind of like reading a letter written back and forth with people. You know, Paul usually gets really deep doctrinal in some places. This is one of the places where he's just writing as a friend. You know, he's writing as a guy who cares, the guy who uh, led them to the Lord and cares about them. And uh, I forgot where I was going with that. Love, that's it. Because the important thing that you ought to be doing and growing in is love, caring about other people, doing what's right. And we've talked about before in 1 John chapter 4 and 5, love is the keeping of God's commandments. Uh, if you love somebody, sometimes you need to hug them. If you love somebody, sometimes you need to rebuke them. Sometimes you need to tell them that they're doing wrong so that they'll start doing right. Sometimes you need to encourage them. Hey, you're doing well. Keep it up. Uh, sometimes you need to say, brother, uh, seems like you're falling away a little bit. Brother, it seems like you're doing something weird a little bit. Brother, you need to strive for the mark. You need to do a little better here. And conversely, it, in the same way, you need to hear instruction and correction from others. You know, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the counsel of his friend. Uh, when somebody comes and sticks you in the gut with a little, you know, hey, Daniel, Hey, brother, how you doing? Uh, good. Uh, the Lord put it on my heart to tell you that, uh, you know, you look effeminate. <laughs> You're dressing like a queer or something like that. You know, that's a joke. <clears throat> something serious. Uh, Daniel, it sure seems like you, you know, you don't really talk about the Bible much. You don't really care about God that much. Uh, are you doing okay? You know, you really ought to care about people. And to love someone and to abound in love towards them means that, as you are growing in the Bible, you are helping others. You are encouraging others. You are praying for others, keeping others on your mind, and ministering to others as the Lord leads you. Verse 13, To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So the last little bit of this verse, and we've talked about it before, every chapter in 1 Thessalonians end with the theme, which is Jesus Christ is coming back. Uh, and 1 Thessalonians is one of the best places to go in and learn about the coming of Jesus Christ. We know it's coming soon. Uh, we know that Jesus Christ, when he comes at the uh, what is called the rapture, a lot of people call the rapture. We don't use that word because it's not in the Bible. We call it the translation. Uh, there are a lot of Bible words for it, like the translation, the catching away. Uh, those are my two favorite to use for it. And uh, when we get caught up, is what I'm talking about. When Jesus Christ comes back before the tribulation and catches the church up, uh, it's important to understand that when Jesus Christ comes back at that first coming there, the world doesn't see him. Uh, you'll see in chapter 4, he comes in the clouds. And as far as we can tell, nobody on the earth is going to see Jesus Christ. Uh, he's going to be in the clouds, and he's going to come and catch away the bride, the church, and he's going to go back up with us. And we're all going to be up there with him for about seven years during the tribulation. Right here, 1 Thessalonians 3.13, he's not talking about uh, the first part of his second coming when he catches us up. He's talking about the second part, which is called the Advent, uh, when Jesus Christ comes down with armies. And we're going to look at a couple things about that. So we're talking about when Jesus Christ actually comes back, according to 2 Thessalonians, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Uh, how do you know that, Daniel? It's because he's coming with all his saints. With all his saints. Look at Revelation chapter 19. We're going to go really quickly uh, and showing just a brief little snapshot. Probably, I don't know the exact number, I'd say at least 70% of the Bible, a huge chunk of the Bible is prophecy. Um, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you think some of the biggest books in there are about prophecy. And prophecy's main subject and seems like the Bible's main subject is the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's very important. Uh, and the Bible talks about it all the time. And uh, so many of the chapters and verses you don't understand in the minor prophets and the major prophets and Psalms, uh, if you step back and slow down and look at it a little bit, um, the first thing you can probably assume is this probably has something to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's one of the first places I look. I think, how does this verse pertain to his second coming? Uh, what, what does this mean in relation to when he comes back? It's not always going to be the case, but that's usually where I start um, because it's so prevalent in the Bible. Revelation 19, thank the Lord, is where he plainly lays out. Here's what it's going to look like. 
you know, here's the second coming. Here's when he comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Look at verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flaming fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. It's obviously talking about Jesus Christ here. Riding a white horse, his name's faithful and true. You say, is he coming down to bring peace on earth? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, flame of fire, crowns. Uh, and we'll read on. It doesn't go too well for the people he's coming down to. Look at verse 14. And the armies. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You say, who's wearing the fine linen? Who are these armies? Who's coming down with Jesus Christ? Uh, look back at verse, where is it? 19, verse 7 and 8. 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife. Who's that? The bride, the church, us, everybody who's in the church. And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her, who's her? Us, the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Of who? Of saints. Remember, First Thessalonians 2, we're talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. You say, what's your point, Daniel? In verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What does that tell me? That tells me that I and you, if you're saved, are going to be in that army. In one of those armies. <laughs> it's multiple armies. And uh, we could go into that maybe another time, how that there are several armies. Um, in Song of Solomon, it points to two armies. I. It could be just two. It seems to me like there might be more. I'm not sure. Because there are several groups of people who are on God's side at this time. One, there's going to be the church, the bride. Two, there's going to be Old Testament Jewish saints. Three, uh, the angels are the Lord's host, which is an army. Um, there are lots of different armies throughout the Bible, and we're going to be one of them uh, when Jesus comes back. So get ready. Uh, it's going to be crazy. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And you can read on there. It's obviously, Jesus Christ comes down and slays all the bad guys who are on the earth. And there's going to be a whole lot of blood. And a whole lot of dead bodies. And you say, that's not the Jesus I know. Jesus is sweet. Yeah, well, he's also righteous. He's also just. He's a judge. He has to pass judgment on the wicked, and he will. And that's the moment. And notice, you're going to be with him. And something I want to show you, uh, I guess last, Psalm 149. We can stop here. Psalm chapter 149 and verse 6. So remember, we are a part of those armies. So when Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation, we're going to be riding down with him on horses. Uh and you're going to have something else. Psalm 149, look at verse 6. It says, actually, verse 4. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And what? A two-edged sword in their hand. You say, okay. That's weird. Why would the saints have a two-edged sword in their hand? Verse 7, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. You know, a lot of Christians believe that the spiritual warfare uh, that we are involved in is not real. 
they think it's kind of a picture. You know, Ephesians 6, the whole armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, uh, the shield of faith. They think all these things are not real things. They think that's just a picture God gave us to kind of help us along. Well, no, they are very real things. And if you could see yourself in the spiritual realm, you'd see whether you've got armor on. Uh, It's a very real thing that you actually have to put on. And there is a real warfare going on as a Christian. So, as a Christian, you ought to be keenly aware that you are fighting battles every day. And so, because of that, it shouldn't surprise you that when we are going to be with Jesus, and it's talking about that at Psalm 149, when we are going to be with Jesus, we are going to have a two-edged sword in our hand when we come back with him. You say, how do you know that? Because it says, this honor have all his saints. You say, Daniel, that's a terrible thing. Why, why would I have a sword? Well, it says right there to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Right. That sounds terrible, Daniel. You're going to kill people? You are too. That's a horrible thing. Verse 9, this honor. This honor have all his saints. And a big point I'm trying to get to you is always let the Bible dictate the way you think. Always let the Bible dictate the way you believe. And my initial thought is, I don't want to carry a sword and slay people. You know, I want to let Jesus do it. You know, I'm not holy enough. Well, the Bible says that you're going to carry a sword. You're going to execute judgment upon heathen at that time. And uh, you're going to bind kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron. You're going to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor. It is an honor. So starting right now, think It is an honorable thing. It is an honor that you're going to get to be with Jesus Christ in his army fighting against the heathens uh, there at Armageddon at the end of the tribulation, at that great battle, at that great and terrible day of the Lord. It's an honor that you get to fight with him. Uh, You say, Daniel, how in the world did you get there from 1 Thessalonians 3? We were just talking about encouraging and comfort, and now you're talking about slaying kings with a sword. Yeah, well, the Bible's deep. Uh, The Bible's very deep, and the Bible... Is plain. You can understand it. I can understand it uh, as long as God shows it to you. And in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Um, you're going to be in that group if you're saved. And I just wanted to give you a little picture. The Lord gives us pictures so that we can have an understanding. And he'll give us you know, a little light here in Isaiah, a little light here in Micah, a little light here in Revelation, a little light here in Psalms. And you, you piece that puzzle together and you get a whole picture, which is glorious. You know, It's a wonderful thing when you start to understand those things. And I just gave you a little piece to the puzzle of Jesus Christ's second coming. And I hope it's a blessing to you. If you're terrified and you're like, I don't want to wield the sword, then just start praying that, um, you know, Start studying, studying the scriptures a little more. You'll start to understand. It'll start to be a sweet thing to you instead of bitter. And, um, and that's it. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's pray. Lord, thanks so much for your word. Thank you that uh, you can make it plain to us, that your spirit helps us and guides us as we study. And I thank you for uh, everybody here. And uh, I just ask that if I said anything that wasn't true, if I said anything I shouldn't have, that you'll erase it from people's memory, erase it from their hearts. And Uh, Forgive me for that, and I pray that you'll uh, let them remember and to keep the things that were good and true. And I thank you again for your word. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.